The U.S. presidential primaries are ending soon, with the presumptive candidates being Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. It is widely believed by many that out of all the candidates, the worst two possible choices have risen to the top. A large segment of the U.S. population views Clinton as a career politician who makes backroom deals to her own benefit and a potential criminal because of her unsecured servers with classified documents. An equally large portion of the population views Donald Trump as angry, racist, irrational, unstable, self-serving, or any combination of those. Donald Trump is a phony, a fraud. His promises are as worthless as a degree from Trump University. If democracy represents the will of the people, then how is it that two equally unpopular candidates have become our nominees? And why is it that no third party has risen to save us from this madness? There are two pivotal reasons for our current situation, and both have nothing to do with voters' personal preferences. The first reason is that first-past-the-post voting, or winner-take-all voting, which is our current system, is one of the least effective voting methods. It is easy to understand and simple to take account for, but yields unstable results for any democracy. The second reason is that staggered presidential primaries create false preferences for candidates and give some states disproportional influence on elections. Today's video will take a look at both of these issues in depth and explain how they contribute to our current situation and offer solutions for both. First past the post voting, which is better known as winner take all voting, is the system we currently use and it works by awarding leadership to the candidate who accumulates the most total votes. Sometimes instead of gathering the most total votes, a candidate can be required to accumulate at least 50% of the total votes in order to have a majority. At first glance, this system appears to be simple, effective, and even efficient. It's easy to understand, should pick the candidate whom the most people support, and it's super easy to account for all the votes. Unfortunately, this system is flawed by design and leads only to the most moderate choices and not necessarily the most popular ones. Also, the mathematical end game for winner-take-all voting is the creation of a two-party system. System. Imagine the following scenario. If everyone voted equally from a field of five candidates, you might find a distribution something like this, with the ultra-liberal and ultra-conservative candidates generally getting less support and more support toward the moderates. However, a majority of the people, this case in 32%, technically a plurality, support the more conservative candidate. However, since only 32% of people support this candidate and not a majority, this technically creates a minority rule. People learn this lesson very well after one or two elections, and in the next cycle, voters from both ends move their support toward the middle candidate in order to get a compromised candidate whose agenda is closer to their own beliefs. In this instance, after one year, the moderate candidate almost doubled their support. It went up again in years three, and by the time we got to year four, they had almost a 90% support. And you can see a similar pattern playing out in most election cycles. The idea here is that you get somebody close to your beliefs versus someone who's totally different. In just a few short cycles, voters become conditioned to choose the most moderate candidate and occasionally one just slightly off of moderate. You know, I get accused of being kind of moderate and center. I plead guilty. I think sometimes it's important when you're in the elected arena, you try to figure out how do you bring people together to get something done instead of just standing on the opposite sides yelling at each other. This leaves a majority of voters feeling underrepresented. Results like these are something that many of us learn early on as children. That is why we have the concept of wasted votes. In the above scenario, even if you voted for the candidate whom you actually believed in, your vote would be worthless if it wasn't for one of the candidates that was acceptable to the wider public. A vote for anybody but the runner-up is therefore a wasted vote, or mathematically a vote for the other party. That is why a large portion of the voters chose to vote tactically and to support candidates whom they thought had a realistic chance of winning the election. It has been statistically proven that winner-take-all voting always results in a two-party dominant system. This has been modeled mathematically by Maurice Duverger as early as 1951. His conclusions are not merely speculative, but are relatively well accepted within political science circles. If you want to read more about it, you can check out Duverger's Law, which is linked below in the description, and it's also easily observed in the United States' current political system. Having only two parties is a political oligopoly that can be easily corrupted or collude with each other, or in some cases distance itself from the people that they're supposed to represent. The next time you hear about a bipartisan meeting or a bipartisan study published on the news, keep in mind that bipartisan is is not nonpartisan. Bipartisan, by definition, only appeals to the biases of two groups. 
While this may sound scary, it doesn't mean that democracy is a failure or inherently broken. It only means that the winner-take-all voting system is less than ideal for a successful democracy. But there are a variety of different voting systems that would offer a significantly better representation of the actual will of the people and would be less easy to exploit. Our first example of an alternate voting system is called ranked voting. In this system, an election ballot would offer a list of candidates on which each voter could accurately express their primary preference and the alternative or secondary candidates they'd be willing to settle for or support. You would simply rank them one, two, three, four, five to however many candidates there are so that you can express your primary, secondary, tertiary, and all the other preferences. Using this system, you may find that the person who has the majority of voters' primary choice is not the most widely supported candidate because because a supermajority may be willing to settle for somebody else. The inherent flaws with this system are that proper weights must be applied to the ranks in order to accurately display people's preferences and that it's harder to account for a single vote. However, this would help eliminate the issue of wasted votes and it would encourage people to not vote for a compromised candidate. Another possibility would be cumulative voting, which is somewhat similar to ranked voting. However, in this case, a voter can individually weight each candidate and they're very visible and easy to account for. For example, a voter would be given a total of 10 votes, and I'm not just crazy, you could actually vote 10 times in this election, or points to distribute among candidates as they see fit. They can cast as many votes as they want for any candidate up to that number of 10. This can be used to show the level of support for their primary choice and how strongly they support different alternatives. In some cases, the second choice might be a very distant second, and in other cases it might be a much more even spread. This allows voters to individually self-regulate their preferences and candidates with their votes. And finally, this system is much easier to account for than ranked voting, and it's fairly easy to understand. A third option would be instant runoff voting. In most cases, this system allows for any candidate to win immediately if they get more than 50% of the vote. However, if no candidate can get 50% of the vote on the first try, then the bottom candidate, or depending on your pool size, the bottom several candidates can become eliminated and a new round of voting begins. This process is repeated over and over again until a candidate gets the desired 50% majority. This system is already in use in several countries around the world and is very effective at choosing a appealing candidates. The biggest and most obvious flaw to this method is that it can be somewhat time-consuming. But, as we've said, our current voting system is only half of the problem. There's still the issues of the primaries themselves. The primaries are currently spread out over about five months from February to June every year. Each state is able to set its own time for primaries, and the first several primaries are almost like reality TV shows. Show flexibility. Be able to make a change. There are a lot of candidates with a wide range of beliefs, and many of them are eliminated within a month or two. While this may sound like a good system for moderating candidates and eliminating poor choices, kind of like our runoff voting example, it actually skews the entire process because of disproportional inputs from some states. The states who vote the earliest get to essentially eliminate candidates that they don't like and help establish the frontrunners for the rest of the election. Even if those states have less total delegates than others, the early influence is so massive that it can cause certain candidates to drop out early, even if they would have had more supporters in bigger states. They simply can't afford to stay in the race long enough to reach those states' primaries. This is why Iowa is more important than California in our primary system, despite clear differences in the actual importance of these states in terms of population and economy. The early states are not chosen for their influence or size or demographic makeup either. Since states can set their own times for primaries, there's ultimately no clear rhyme or reason for the orders of the primaries. The parties themselves do have rules about timing and penalties for voting early, but that doesn't seem to change the randomness of the whole situation. For our two-party system, this means that conservative states like Arkansas get more influence on the Democratic candidates than larger liberal states like California, even though Californians are really going to be the ones who are voting voting for those candidates in the general election. What that means is that California's favorite candidates could get eliminated before they even get a chance to vote. In most cases, the survivors of early primary votes are the candidates with the best name recognition, like, say, Somehow Donald like Trump. Uh, even as a very young kid, the word Trump sort of meant rich to It you. meant success. Success. Success, right. yeah.
They are not the best candidates, the most broadly appealing ones, or even the most experienced. Rather, they are the candidates that have managed to be on TV or in the public spotlight enough before the primaries have even started. For instance, this year Donald Trump survived the early rounds of voting even though he was widely considered a joke candidate. He was able to get people voting for him in the primaries based simply on name recognition alone and some pandering. This allowed him to stay in the race long enough until he could appeal to the wider Republican base and cement his lead later in the year. Next up, we have the issue of delegates and superdelegates. While it is worrisome that delegates are not legally bound to vote for certain candidates at the convention, they almost always do. Breaking from your constituents' choice pretty much equals political suicide. The U.S. Democratic Party, however, also has a special group of delegates called superdelegates. These people are not beholden to represent any interests but their own, and they make up approximately 15% of the total delegates. In a few states, they are required to represent their state's primary choice, but those are rare. These superdelegates are composed of current elected officials, such as distinguished party members, election officials, and all Democratic members of the House and Senate, and all Democratic governors that are currently sitting. They often support party interests, but can trade voting favors instead. For instance, in the 2016 primary cycle, Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton are almost neck and neck for citizen votes. However, Clinton has an overwhelming majority of superdelegates on her side because of her and her husband's influence within the Democratic Party. The amount of superdelegates supporting her almost assured her election before the primaries even began. Bernie Sanders' strategy to beat that was to get enough popular votes to make superdelegates defect to his side. In the end, this strategy didn't work out in his favor. As you can clearly see, this process, and almost everything about it, is undemocratic. It gives a select group of people a disproportionate amount of voting power, which effectively creates an oligarchic type system rather than a democracy. It should be noted that Republicans do have superdelegates as well, but they are bound to vote by their state's choices. It essentially just gives those states extra delegates. So the primary system is clearly broken, but how do we fix it? The simplest answer is that we have to petition our two primary political parties, the federal government and the states themselves, in order to change the rules to be more democratic because each one of these parties has a say in the process. One of the popular solutions is to establish what we will call a primary day, which would be a single day where all primaries are held at once. This will prevent candidates from getting eliminated early based on the biases and political preferences of certain states and prevent name recognition alone from being a selector and it will also allow for people across the country to have the widest possible choices of voting. However, having all primaries on one day essentially just creates a pre-election of sorts and unfortunately it would be costly, campaigning would start super early and it may even be more likely to create unstable results. A far better solution would be to have three rounds of primaries relatively close together and composed of states chosen for their particular demographics. Populated conservative and liberal states can vote on the same day as well as several less populated ones to prevent skewed voting. The next round will be another set of states with a similar makeup of demographics, but in population and economy, etc., etc., and would take place one to two weeks after the first round. This will prevent utter madness and allow for some elimination of unpopular candidates and have minimal delay in the process. Finally, superdelegates, both Republican and Democrat, need to be removed because, after all, they are a side effect, a cancerous growth of the two-party system, which in turn was the result of the utterly flawed first-past-the-post voting system that we currently have in place. In a system with only two parties, both parties are free to change the rules in a way that severely undermines the principles of democracy, and they can get away with it. That's all for this video. I hope that you enjoyed it and that you learned something useful. If you did, don't forget to like, favorite, and subscribe, or you can check out my next video, which is going to be on global warming. Drifter out.